Welcome to another episode of Curbside Consults, where we take a deep dive into the practice-changing research published in the New England Journal of Medicine. My name is James O'Connell, and I'm an editorial fellow at NEGM. On this episode of Curbside Consults, we're going to discuss the role of technology in managing diabetes. To do this, we are joined by Professor Derek O'Keefe, endocrinologist at University Hospital of Galway in Ireland, and Professor of Medical Device Technology at National University of Ireland, Galway. Welcome, Professor O'Keefe, and thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me today. I'm really excited to talk about this topic, which is changing outcomes for the better for our patients. Great. So to begin with, Derek, maybe you could tell us why is now a good time to discuss the role of technology in diabetes management? So I think a lot of factors have come together to make the 2020s the decade of diabetes and technology. Primarily, you've got to go back to what we call Moore's Law in physics and electronics, whereby in the 1970s, they realized that the density of electronics you could put on a microcontroller or an integrated circuit doubles. And what that essentially means is that the memory and the processing power doubles every 12 to 18 months. And this Moore's law has transformed computing from big desktop machines to computers now on your wrist. And we see that all around in our connected world in what's called the internet of things. And if you think about the most common personal computer now, the smartphone, that's only been out since 2007 when Apple released their iPhone. And now there's other manufacturers as well with smartphones. And in a very short period of time, we have this connected ecosystem of lots of different smart devices paired to this really powerful device that sits in our pocket. And this smartphone can, as you know, run software like all types of apps. And because of that, of that shrinking of the physical size and the doubling of the actual speed of processing, It's a unique time in our evolution to bring this technology to the bedside, as it were, for the benefit of our patients. And diabetes care can be challenging for both patients and physicians. And in my mind, involves a significant amount of lifestyle management, multidisciplinary team involvement, and oral hypoglycemic or insulin agents, of which there are many. So where exactly does medical technology fit into diabetes care? That's a great question. And you're right. I mean, my patients tell me having diabetes is like, trying to live your life as everyone else does, but at the same time, for example, trying to keep a balloon off the ground by just keep tapping it all day long to keep it in the air. And we know from attending parties in our life that that's a really difficult thing to do after a while because the balloon goes left and right, and you've got to really move around to try and keep it in the same place. So you imagine doing that all day long, every day, and you get some kind of insight into the burden that's associated with this chronic disease, diabetes. Many of our patients with type 1 diabetes get diagnosed very young in life, and then they have to manage it throughout their childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. And then other patients with type 2 diabetes, a much bigger cohort, over 90% of type 2 diabetes, they have to manage it from often middle age to elderly uh, times. And it's a big problem. It's 600 million people on planet Earth. And because there's such a varied input into your blood sugar control, your diet dictates where your blood sugar will go your exercise. There's so many things involved that it's very complex. And complex tasks are often helped with technology. So now, as I mentioned earlier, we have this amazing technology that can fit in your pocket. And then we have this medical condition, diabetes, that has a really complex problem to solve. When the two of them comes together, it's a solution and a problem that were meant for each other. And when you think about diabetes, I often say to my patients, it's like when you get up in the morning and you're trying to match your insulin with your food and what exercise you're going to take that morning. And patients often try and say, it's like trying to get a hole in one on the golf course every time. And what I try and say to them is, what you're trying to do with the best education and training with the patients and with your providers is that you're trying to try and get at least on the putting green. So at least you're somewhere near the flag. You're never going to get it into the hole every time. No one does that. And what technology does is it makes sure that every time you swing the club and you hit the ball towards the glucose target, as it were, that you do end up somewhere in the potting green and not up in the rough. And that's a really powerful thing for patients because they can often feel that despite their best efforts, they can't get the sugar near the flag, as it were, near the goal region. So with technology, then that enables them to achieve better blood sugar control and therefore takes away a lot of that burden that's been there for a long time before this technology came along. So diabetes and technology were meant for each other, and we're going to see it evolve even more over the next decade, I'm confident of. Technology can really help patients with diabetes manage their condition, but could you tell us maybe exactly what type of technological innovations are being used in diabetes care today? There's a lot. It's the whole spectrum of technology from hardware to software. Um, One of the ones people will be most aware of 
again, back to the smartphone, is the apps that are available. There's tens of thousands of apps available in the diabetes sphere, both on the Android and on the iOS stores. And um, the apps cover everything from bolus wizards to carb counting to psychology apps, trying to figure out what insulin you have to take to make sure that the carbohydrate you're going to ingest don't cause a spike of blood sugar in two hours time that goes outside your range. That's a complex mathematical problem. You've got insulin sensitivity. You've got to figure out your carb ratio. So bolus wizards, I think, should be standard for all patients with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes on insulin. They're fantastic resources whereby you can put in what you're going to eat. It already knows all those kind of ratios, and it tells you then or it suggests how much you should take of insulin to cover that meal based on the sugar you have before you go into that meal. So they've been transformative in the last five years, bolus wizards. But then other apps just looking at the calorie intake and the carb counting, as I mentioned, and then just this chronic burden of disease. There is no holiday from diabetes. So to come to terms with that and to manage it, you really have to be in the right headspace. And that's why diabetes is a multidisciplinary team. When patients come to our clinics, they see the physician, the nurse, the dietitian, the podiatrist. But it's also very important to give them the opportunity to speak to psychologists as well. And apps have really filled in that space as well, which is great. Um, so apps, I think, are one of the primary things that have come in technology in the last five years. The data has shown us from the trials that you can achieve a 0.5% or 6 minimal A1C reduction with them, which is great. Other examples that from hardware, of course, you have things like continuous glucose monitors, which give you real-time feedback of your blood sugar. You have flash glucose monitors, which give you retrospective eight hours or so blood sugar readings. You have pumps, insulin pumps, or CSII, continuous subcutaneous insulin infusions. They've been transformative. And again, 50 years ago in the 70s, these devices were the size of a backpack. And now insulin pumps are the size of a matchbox. So they're much smaller, much more ergonomic, and therefore much more likely to be worn by the patients. And of course, there's all the software that goes with it as well. The actual online cloud-based architecture that's out there now that allows our patients to see their blood sugars on their devices or at home on their computers and share them with their practitioners so that they can have really rich discussions then when they attend either virtually or in presence physically for their diabetes follow-up. So an awful lot of technological innovations in diabetes care that are going to actually just explode even more. I think of it like the Cambrian explosion of life. This is a unique time to, with technology and diabetes and our patients are benefiting from us and we're benefiting from it as well because we're getting better outcomes for our patients, which is what we want, obviously. One of the things uh, Derek, you mentioned there that I wanted to ask you a bit more about was continuous glucose monitoring, which is something patients seem to be increasingly using. Could you tell us maybe what are some of the benefits of continuous glucose monitoring or CGM for patients? Yeah, so CGM have been, again, transformative in the last few years. It stands for continuous glucose monitoring because traditionally patients used to use finger stick blood sugar monitoring. So they used to have to lance their finger, take some blood sample from it, and then put that into a glucometer device. We would encourage them to do that four times a day, pre-breakfast, pre-lunch, pre-dinner, and pre-bed. So we could get a feeling of where their blood sugar excursions were during the day. But that's only four values over 24 hours. And not all patients do that because, again, it's a chronic burden to do that. So CGM has transformed that analysis of blood sugar in that you put the device typically on your abdomen. And then over the course of a day, it takes about 300 readings and transfers it straight to your phone or onto the cloud. And having all that extra information is fantastic because with more information, you can make better decisions. And I think that's the first thing that CGM gives our patients, it gives them more insight into their blood sugars than the traditional monitoring with four values a day. From that insight then, what the evidence has shown is that CGM can improve patients' glycemic control. They have lower HbA1c's, they have less hypoglycemias, which is fantastic. And part of that is because they can have fast proactive control because they can get alerts if they're going low and deal with it, or indeed if they're going high, they get alerts and they can deal with it. And then just from a day-to-day -day human point of view, they have to do less finger pricks on their hands, which reduces pain and burden that of carrying all those devices. And then they have fewer worries. I have a lot of patients who have young children with diabetes. And because the, the children have CGM, the parents can sleep better at nighttime. One parent told me that the first time they had a proper night's sleep since their child was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes was when they got a CGM for the child, because then the parent was able to sleep because they knew they would get alerted during the night if anything happened, as opposed to before the CGM, they would often go into the child and prick their finger during the night because of anxiety that they had. So 
but really has been transformative. And it's a great example in medicine of technology changing the landscape in patient care. So you gave a really good example there, Derek, of the use of continuous glucose monitors in children that have served as, as reassuring for parents. Could you tell us, though, maybe who are the ideal candidates for CGM? And are there patients for whom CGM just wouldn't be suitable? So that's a really good question. I mean, CGM has been shown in the trials to be very useful for people if they, for example, have impaired awareness of hypoglycemia or maybe one or more severe hypoglycemias per year. And by severe, we mean that they need the assistance of somebody else to recover from hypoglycemia. The trials have shown that CGM is really good in patients with diabetes who are pregnant. As I mentioned, children or young people, it's been beneficial in. And then people who have persistent hyperglycemia, HbA1c's of over 8.5%, despite their best efforts with routine management. Um, So there's a lot of patients who this technology is ideal for, which is great. There is, of course, patients who it's not suitable for. And I guess that comes back to personal and patient preference. A lot of patients want the extra information and don't mind carrying the extra hardware, as it were, on, on their body. But some patients don't want to be that connected to technology. And you have to listen to the patient and what their needs and desires are and then have a shared decision making discussion with them to ensure that you think the technology is a good thing as a doctor, but maybe the patient doesn't want it and they're not at the right time for it. So you have to make very sure that they understand what they're getting and the benefits of it so that they really are receptive to it. Because if you give people a piece of technology, what they found early on in the studies was people really use it for a week or two. There was kind of a new gadgetitis about it that they were happy to use it, but then use fell off rapidly after that. Kind of like everyone being excited about going to the gym in January, but then it kind of falls away after that. And you can see really clearly with people with CGM, their use of it, because that's actually one of the metrics that's reported when you print out the last few weeks of data. So if you see people who have CGM but are not using it, it's a great opportunity to find out what are the barriers to using it. And often it can be psychological that they feel that they don't want to be connected to technology all the time. Um, So that's a really important thing to identify those patients early and to make sure that you're giving people a technology that they will actually use. So are there aspects of continuous glucose monitoring that patients may find difficult to integrate into their diabetes management? I guess straight away when you bring in continuous glucose management, as well as giving someone this really powerful tool, you're also giving them extra information. And some patients would say to you, you know, doc, there's a lot going on in my life. Now I have all this extra sugar data to deal with. It's like trying to take a drink from a fire hose, all this data. And as well as that, all this new terminology, when the CGMs first came out from lots of different manufacturers, it was clear that we needed to develop a standard so that all clinicians could interpret them in a logical and repeatable way. So the AGP was developed, the Amateur Glucose Profile, which kind of integrates all the data collected from CGMs onto a single formalized report but lots of different measures, one of which is TIR, time and range. And this is a completely new concept because of the ability of CGM to record blood sugars in such a frequent manner. Now we can get 300 values a day, and very clearly you can see the percentage time that a patient is in range. And when I say in range, what I mean is 70 to 180 milligrams per deciliter or or 4 to 10 millimoles per liter. And so in a 24-hour period, you would hope that your patients were at least 17 out of 24 hours or 70 percent time in rain it's back to that example again about the golf course they're never going to get a hole in one every time and be 100 percent. that's just not possible if anything it shows you how amazing the biological pancreas is at keeping us in homeostasis but with the best technology with the cgm we can get up to 70 percent and then with other technology that we'll talk about you can get up even higher to 80 and even 90 percent especially overnight when they're sleeping and there's no glucose perturbations. But CGM brings a lot to the table. It allows patients to get more information, but there's also has to be a commitment from them to learn the new technology and the vocabulary that goes with it to maximize the benefit from it. And as well as the patients learning the technology and the new terminology that goes with it, I guess for physicians, the same could be said to be true. Are there challenges for physicians when trying to integrate new technologies such as CGM into diabetes management? Yes, I would think that's a fair comment. I think that we all trained at med school at a certain time, and then medicine moves so fast, it's so important for all of us to continuously update our education and skills. And that's true across the clinical pathway from doctors to nurses to podiatrists to dietitians. So when you're trying to bring this brand new methodology to help patients into your clinic, everyone has to be upskilled. 
and that can be quite a resource drain on the department and it has to be factored into the strategic planning and then the infrastructure when you have people coming in with pumps there's going to have to be computers there to allow you to look at the reports and so on and often these days especially in the last two years a lot of these are cloud-based repositories of sugar so again the healthcare clinic or hospital that you're at has to have that facility to have rapid access and high-speed bandwidth to look at that data. So these are the kind of things that are practical considerations. And then, of course, all this technology isn't without cost. A pump and a CGM, for example, they're far more expensive than the traditional finger blood sugar monitor and then an insulin pen or an insulin vial. So that cost-benefit analysis has to be done as well by the healthcare system that you work in. But the studies so far have shown clinical benefit from these tools. And ultimately, as the technology gets cheaper, again, because of Moore's laws we talked about earlier, the cost benefit will be in the favor of the technology for sure. Another thing I wanted to ask you about is fully closed loop insulin delivery systems. How advanced are insulin pumps today and are closed loop insulin delivery systems being used in clinical practice? That's a great question. And the answer is yes. A lot of people thought that when you had a glucose monitor to tell you what your blood sugar is, and then you had another device, which was an insulin pump to deliver insulin, perhaps you could mimic the biological pancreas by creating an artificial pancreas and therefore have an algorithm say that if the sugar is very high, give insulin, and if the sugar is very low, stop giving insulin. And that's the rudimentary basics of the closed loop insulin pump or the artificial pancreas. These terminologies have been used a lot in the literature in the last 10 years. Initially, they were very basic. The two devices just talked. And as the technology has improved, again, back to Moore's law, and as the algorithms have improved in the clinical testing, we now have devices that do do that. So that if the blood sugar is high, and not even if it goes high, it can actually predict a trend high and start to increase the insulin. And equally, if the sugar is not at a low point, but trending low, it can start to reduce the insulin. And then other devices that are out there are actually dual hormone. They have insulin and glucagon. And so it's a really fascinating area of research because there are so many variables. So even when I give somebody insulin now, the effect won't happen for at least 60 to 90 minutes. So that kind of lag has to be built into the algorithm. And equally, the blood sugar that you measure is really from a CGM interstitial sugar. And therefore, you have to build that factor into it that there's a lag there. Initially, when these CGM devices came on out, it was almost a 15 minute lag. Now it's much less, more like five minutes. But again, very complex algorithms have to have been created over the last decade. They're getting much better. And it's akin to kind of the NASA missions to Mars, whereby it takes so long for the data to get back from Mars, the algorithm has to be intelligent enough on the robots up there to make sure that if they see something acutely, that they can manage it there locally and build in all the lag into it from mission control. And these closed loop artificial pancreas algorithms are very similar. They're able to build in the lag of the sensor the lag of the insulin action to get what we call now a hybrid closed loop, whereby the sensor sees high, sees low, and then the insulin plus or minus the glucagon and some pumps can react accordingly. So we really are at the state of the art clinically. And what's coming down the line now is the next generation, which in this decade will be closed loop insulin pumps fully, which also take into account things like exercise. So If the pump knows the human wearing it is about to exercise or is exercising, it can pick that up, for example, from a pedometer, and then it can say, this person's exercising, their blood sugar is going to fall, therefore I need to reduce the insulin because they're naturally burning the blood sugar in their muscles. And then reciprocally, if they're going to eat food, the devices are able to know that you're going to eat food. Perhaps it uses a GPS saying that you're in a restaurant and it's two o'clock in the day and you're sitting down and all these factors together in a state machine can tell the device that, yeah, the likelihood this person is going to eat, and therefore it starts to increase the insulin before even the blood sugar goes up. So it's fascinating research about predicting where the sugar is going to go. And that's where we are now with the state of the art in research for insulin pumps. Thanks, Derek. And you've talked us through how medical technology has helped patients with diabetes in recent years, but future medical technology developments are on the horizon to improve diabetes care for patients. The closed-loop insulin pumps are going to be the mainstay of treatment, and those devices are going to get smaller, more ergonomic, and also those separate things like glucose sensors and pumps, they're going to be integrated into a single device that somebody will put on, and ultimately these devices will become implantable. There's a lot of research labs and companies around the world working on that kind of technology. 
But separate to that, the actual software, the big data that I talked about from the CGM, but now coupled with artificial intelligence algorithms, there's some really interesting things coming out of that. And primarily what artificial intelligence or machine learning subset of it does is, is it spots patterns. And from those patterns, then it's able to predict the future, as it were. And recently, there's been some data from IBM with their supercomputer, Watson, which has shown that they're able to predict a hypoglycemia happening in a patient several hours in advance of the hypoglycemia. So I'm not saying that like I'm looking at your blood sugar right now and your blood sugar 10 minutes ago and say you're trending low. You need to correct that by taking some sugar sweets or sugar juice to prevent you getting a hypoglycemia. I'm saying that many hours before that, they can predict that someone's going to go low later in the afternoon or later in the night. And they're able to do that because they're able to look at all your own personal data and the typical patterns that you have. And so when you've previously had a hypoglycemia, this was the sugar pattern the 24 hours before that. And therefore, if that pattern happens again, they would be able to flag it to you and say, you're probably going to go low tonight and therefore you should take corrective action now. And not only from your data, the intradata, but the interdata from all the other tens of thousands of people with diabetes and their blood sugar patterns, they're able to analyze them and come up with much more refined algorithms. So that's going to be very exciting in the next decade, using AI to make us better at managing diabetes than any human could. And, you know, as clinicians, we're happy to delegate that work to machines because that's what machines should be doing and letting us get back to the work of being clinicians, being there for our patients, explaining to them how the technology works and how it, it can help them and taking the burden away from them to allow them to get on and live their life healthily. Yes, that's a really exciting prospect to think of that big data and artificial intelligence could be used to help patients manage their diabetes in the future. That wraps up this episode of Curbside Consults. I would like to thank Professor Derek O'Keefe for joining us today in our discussion about the role of medical technology in diabetes management. Our production team here at NEGM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Tomasov, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Cathy Stern. Special thanks also to our NEGM education editor, Dr. O.P. Hamvik. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future podcast topics, please email us at president360 at NEGM.org. Remember to subscribe to the NEGM social media sites, including Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook via the NEGM.org pages. On behalf of the New England Journal of Medicine, this is James O'Connell signing off.